there fellow soldiers and welcome once again to appropriating the culture thanks for watching thanks for supporting this and for all the shares and likes and hearts and comments please keep those coming because as we know in our culture silence is violence so you think about that the next time you refuse to comment on these videos that's like punching me in the face and violence has no place in our society or in our art or does it I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your insider today as we appropriate some culture. Is it ever okay for Christians to be violent? Do we have moral and biblical justification for Christians to serve in our military? Is pacifism a higher virtue? What constitutes a morally justified war? Or is there even such a thing? Those kinds of difficult theological questions won't be addressed today. Instead, we're gonna talk about movies and video games. As we've said a thousand times at this point, sin is not external. It's not what comes in that makes us or causes us to sin. But it can influence, which is why Christians often restrict what they watch or listen to. However, you might notice that many Christians are more lenient about violence than they are about nudity or profanity in their entertainment which is interesting and I think instructive about how we approach art. I think the first reason that Christians are less sensitive to violent imagery is because the Bible is stuffed with violence. It's just a few pages in till you get to a murder, and then a little bit further you get to the extermination of nearly all life on the planet. Things don't get much better after that, but they do get more graphic. Judges is quite a visual book. Here's the story of a really fat king of Moab being murdered. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Well, that's lovely. There's also quite an X-rated story about a Levite and his concubine. She gets gang raped and tortured and abused until she dies. And then the Levite dismembers her corpse into 12 pieces and sends it out to each of the tribes. Yeah, that's in the Bible. Uh, people are stoned to death, they're hanged to death, they're beheaded, they're burned alive, they're thrown off cliffs, towers, and other high places. They get their thumbs cut off, they get their eyes gouged out, pregnant women are ripped open, infants are dashed to the ground. There's murder, there's rape, there's cannibalism, mothers eat their own children. That's in the good book. And Jesus himself had the occasional violent outburst. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Silence isn't violence, but whipping people would constitute. And Jesus told stories with violence in them. The Good Samaritan starts with a robbery and a beating. The parable of the tenant farmers has multiple beatings and a murder. The parable of the ten talents ends with the king ordering that his enemies be brought to him and killed in front of him. So when we see historical and some figurative and even fictional violence in scripture, that, that shapes the way we think about violent portrayals in other mediums. So that's one reason Christians are more tolerant of violence in art. The second major reason is that when it comes to violence, Christians have a better grasp on the concept that exposure is not sin. Reading those horrifying and violent stories in scripture doesn't cause me to sin, and exposure to such depictions of violence doesn't compel me to follow suit. We don't feel that we're more likely to commit murder just because we read about a murder or saw one on the TV. So in that way, Christians better understand that exposure to sin is not sin, and exposure need not corrupt us. Hmm. Interesting. 
But I'm not sure that reasoning will hold when it comes to our latest sponsor. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to you by Blood and Gore 4. Slaughter, maim, decimate, and drink the blood of your foes in Blood and Gore 4. Bloodier and gorier than Blood and Gore 3 and Blood and Gore 2. And by 2, I mean as well. Nothing is bloodier or gorier than Blood and Gore 2. It was banned in several countries. Download Blood and Gore 4 today on PlayStation, Xbox, or PC and slice 10% off the purchase when you use my promo code CULTURE at checkout. Alrighty, so uh, Christians are more lenient about violence in media, especially if the violence is cartoonish. You can do all manner of violence so long as you don't see the real world consequence of violence. But blood and gore and disturbing images are often objected to in Christian circles. You can show David slaying Goliath, but we cut out the part, pun intended, where he chops off Goliath's head and carries it around with him because that's, you know, disturbing. Now, there's certainly gratuitous violence. There's actually a term for it. It's called torture porn. And that's a pretty apt term because it's calling out the fact that it's not an artistic expression. It's not in service to story or theme or truth. And that's what makes it gratuitous. It's not the level of violence or how explicit or how gory. One, one of the favorite films in Christian circles is incredibly graphic. And some critics of The Passion of the Christ called it torture porn and said it was gratuitous. But for Christians, uh, we understood the intention and purpose and meaning behind the gore and violence and graphic nature of the film. And so we were okay with it. But that kind of analysis should be applied to all films. Violence and gore are sometimes necessary to elicit a certain response from the audience or to serve the story, the themes, or communicate truths. Okay, well, that might be okay, but, but one thing we're not going to do is simulate violence. You know, in the early days of video games, nobody cared if you blew away legions of space invaders. The violence of video games was not much of an issue because it was cartoon violence. The primitive nature of the graphics made it the equivalent of Bugs Bunny smashing somebody in the face with a frying pan. But as technology advanced, the violent images became more and more realistic and therefore more and more disturbing. And added to the mix was interactivity. It's not just passively viewing violent and gory imagery. It's actively instigating and participating in it. And that has led to a lot of consternation. People were really worried that simulating violence would spill over to real-world violence. When Columbine happened, there was a lot made out of the fact that the perpetrators played Doom. I was a young person at the time, and I remember the breathless media reports about it. And I distinctly remember thinking, I've played Doom. Lots of kids played Doom. Very few people shot up their schools. I'm not sure that the correlation is quite checking out. Video games are a gigantic industry and millions of people play very violent video games every single day in this country. And until we started to defund the police, violent crime has been dropping for the past 20 years. Now, there are studies that show that exposure to violent and gory video games and violent and gory movies desensitizes us to violence and gore. But those studies really don't prove what it thinks it proves. Uh, we do become desensitized to what we're exposed to. Uh, those studies show how we become desensitized to violence in media, but that doesn't mean we're desensitized to violence in reality. When I was younger, uh, horror films used to scare the crap out of me. We're not doing that bit anymore. I have a bit of an imagination, and so those, those images would haunt me. But now, meh. I've been desensitized. But that doesn't mean that if I were haunted by a demon or chased by an axe-wielding maniac in real life that I wouldn't be disturbed. I would be disturbed. I would be very disturbed. And not at all desensitized to that. See, most people can distinguish between reality and fiction. And being desensitized in one area doesn't make you desensitized in the other. But do you need to watch that? Do you need to play that? No. <laughs> uh, but these are things that do shape the culture. And as we have repeatedly said, if we want to be good producers of art, we need to be good consumers of art. And we should have freedom to do that, not be judged by other Christians. Sin is not external. 
And exposure to violence does not need to corrupt or make you violent. And blood and gore and violence can serve a purpose in context that can actually lead us to truth and even beauty. So Christian artists and audiences shouldn't dismiss these things out of hand. Well, uh, we're going to have to stop there today. Find me on the major socials and end your silent violence against me and leave a question or comment. And I'll see you next week on Appropriating the Culture.